that was the day that I believed that maybe pro is possible. I'm a semi-professional cyclist for Bingo, Wallonie, Brazil. Most athletes are athletes because someone said they couldn't do it. It was a confirmation of what I'd been telling myself for years. We're all there for the same job, to get the team as elevated as possible. We will learn as fast as we prevail. I, I'm not going to comment on much on that. That's a sensitive topic. The listeners want to know what Tom Portsmouth has been up to in the last six months. They've been waiting on the edge of their seats to find out, did he keep the dream alive? Uh, and this is the episode where they find that out. Yeah, I'm a semi-pro. Halfway there. <laughs> exactly. Look, the connection just went slightly down and then back up again. I mean, I did just have two power cuts in close succession, so let's go. <laughs> let's All crack right. on. The Extrospective podcast is sponsored by Runner, which is the first of its kind, number one rated, fully automated running coaching service. Whether you're training for your first marathon, a faster 10k time, or simply couch to 5k, you'll be guided by an expert team, including Olympic marathon runner, Steph Davis. Download Runner, spelt R-U-N-N-A today from the App Store and take your running to the next level. With code Zach, you'll be able to get your first two weeks free and see what all the hype is about. That's Zach, Z-A-K, for your first two weeks free. So, Tom Portsmouth, nearly six months on from the first episode of the Extrospective podcast. Welcome back. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks for having me back, Zach. Um, I can't believe it's six months already gone by. A lot's changed, a lot's moved on, lots of positive things. So, yeah, we're in a good place. Fantastic. Really pleased to hear it. And for the listeners that didn't tune in to that first episode, who is Tom Portsmouth? Well, Tom Portsmouth is an athlete who's in a cycling phase. It's a way that I like to describe it. It's, uh, you know, any sporting career is quite a short career, even if it's 10 or 15 years, which is the maximum average length of a, of a cyclist. And, you know, it's quite a... I feel quite a nice way to detach yourself from the identity crisis that comes later on. Like in general, it's an athlete rather than I attach all my life to cycling. It's a really cool sport and I love it at the moment and I wouldn't change anything about it, but I equally love participating in other sports. Like I've recently restarted uh, the swimming on uh, at SSP with alongside my gym work. So tapping into the roots that I had before, uh, all the yeah. things that we discussed in the first episode right which if people haven't listened to i recommend going going back and checking out because you do provide that kind of full context into how you landed into where you are now exactly. uh, mate, i want to touch on a, a few things uh, that might have changed between now and when we recorded back in the summer of 2022 we're currently recording in february hopefully this goes out on monday so very quick turnaround time for me to get this edited but i wanted to get it out uh, nice and keen as you're just about to head off uh, for your second training camp or third, third. Third, Third training, training camp, camp. With, a but team with the that... Devo team this time. But before we do that, in your own words, how would you summarize the 2022 race season? 2022 road season was one where you started low and it, it was basically a ramp test for eight months. It just kept rising and rising and rising and rising until the climax happened. And then after that, very long build to the high created not so much a low but just not quite so high so in in the perspective of how high you'd climbed it was quite you know a quite a big drop from from that experience so um yeah that's how i would describe last year i started the season out slower maybe a lot of 30s a lot of p30s you know uh and then after covid everything changed perspective changed and the results uh, improved very much. And, and this is racing out in Belgium, isn't it? Climbing all the way through, yeah. I'm yeah, a yeah. race in Belgium, man, at this point. Like, UK is dead. <laughs> and, and that's something that I hope to touch on later on at the back end of the podcast. And, mate, one of the things that I think was quite significant in last season, between when we last recorded and now, was, of course, your win of Bjord Lambrecht. I think that's how you say it. How did that feel, and what was that all about? Yeah, so it was the memorial of Bjorg Lambrecht. He's been running for three years. Um, he died, unfortunately, in 2019 following a crash at the Tour of Poland. A uh, very, very promising guy as a rider. And the race is a very attacking race. 
which you know played into his style as a rider so it's a phenomenal way uh, it's a great way to commemorate his way of riding a bike and honor that and yeah i was proud to have shown that with the way that i closed out that race and how i won that race um how how did you win it so there was like a breakaway of about eight guys going who who'd been out in front for about 80 kilometers of the day is a 150 odd kilometer race and coming into the last three kilometers a friend that i had spoken with midway through the race Mikhail coppins uh attacked and i followed his wheel we did turns for about a k and a half and then he sat on my wheel and then i bridged to the breakaway for the final couple of k's uh more we we started more like about 4k and then yeah we closed down the breakaway within within three kilometers about a 20 second gap um got onto the back of them with 1k to go still about 20 seconds to the peloton we just bridged across and just took as many deep breaths as possible to expel all the carbon dioxide i could from muscles replenish all the lactate into into pyruvate so i could you know continue the energy processes all the sports science coming in handy and launch a sprint about you know 300 meters out and then uh yeah come across the line me first and michael second and then the rest of the eight that we uh came <laughs> <rec> <laughs> so uh one one of them still managed to get a podium uh which was actually adam kelly i think from isle of man um but yeah we uh royally did them the bit that brings me the most joy in racing is you know, it's not training, it's it's not the, you know, sprint to the line, although that helps and does bring a lot of adrenaline. It's the figuring out the tactics on the fly, quick thinking, understanding the processes, what's everyone else thinking, how do I apply that to how I'm feeling and how do I do them over? Um, that brings me the joy and that comes from, as we discussed in the first podcast, the rugby days that quick thinking, fly half, center thinking and communication. But it's communication with myself uh, to, again, understand how everyone else is doing and figuring out a way to work my way around that challenge. And of course, it, it, it was that quick thinking that's brought you so much success over the years that's built you up to this point. And so with the season coming to an end, after we closed off that first podcast what was it like looking for new teams i know as a, as a young rider as a rider coming through the ranks into development in, in the under 23 scene it's quite difficult so just for the listeners who are maybe fans of the sport maybe not even cyclists themselves what's the process of trying to secure a, a spot on like a continental or world tour team so trying to make that jump from racing at a high level to like semi-pro pro teams what's that like and what was that process sure. like for you Sure. It's a, it's a complicated one that takes up a lot of energy uh, throughout that time. So along with the racing, you know, when you weren't racing and you were in the week between, you had a lot of time and a lot of, you know, computer work to build that rapport, try and make some focals, see who's around, uh, get the data and contacts into your laptop and Excel document and whatnot. And I've very done, very much done all that work myself with a few advisories on the side because I value learning that experience and building up that rapport myself. Um, again, with those advisories saying this is possibly how you should go about talking to them, but at the end of the day, it is me talking to whoever I try and call up and, you know, chat up as it were. Uh, so, yeah, that's probably the first way of doing it. you got to block that out when the race comes along because that's distracting as well it's a lot of weight on the shoulders for a lot of riders but that was the thing that I was most proud of last year is setting that aside when the race came about focusing on that targets that I had for that race and how to achieve them through the goals that I'd set um, so I was very able to detach that um, yeah lots of phone calls and lots of LinkedIn messages and so you're having to do this mid-season it's not something that you wrap up the season sit down and then start ringing all these teams you have to do it in amongst all the racing which as you described yeah, there can be quite late. stressful it's yeah. too late at that point if you get there yeah 
do European results matter more than UK? Like, is it possible to get the kind of contract that you've done purely just from racing Thruxton and Mountbatten and <laughs> a couple of nutbees? <laughs> Obviously, there's been a few riders this year from the UK that have made it. Rory Townsend, Ryan Christensen have gone to Pro Team. Uh, Matt Botstock as well. Uh, uh, Jake, Jacob Scott as well. But all from one team on Canyon. Uh, and having competed very, very successfully in UCI European races, I can't comment on the ins and outs of those teams because I don't know how that works. From my perspective and my opinion, you've got to do UCIs um, or the highest Nat A's here. And so you do manage to secure a contract of sorts. Could you take us through what that was and who it's with? It's about who you know, I think, in this game. And there's all all the, too many secrets about that, I think. But or people don't want to admit it, but it is, I think, who you know. And well, that's a skill as well, right? It's not just coincidence. exactly. That's why I wanted to build up that rapport myself. I had identified that over three years of developing and figuring out and questioning. As the premise of this podcast is, you know, introspection but extrospection. Yeah. After those three years, I was like, okay, I'm going to build this myself and build that rapport and got Greg on board and did two fantastic seasons there and used his abundance of contacts into helping me get the spot on the team. Obviously, I had to do the results myself because that's the second part of it. It's one thing having the contacts and then you build that with the results that you have. Um, so yeah, it was a two-way process. So if you were to describe your, what your current role is and who you ride for, how would you do so? I'm a semi-professional cyclist for Bingo, Wallonie, Brazil. And you must have imagined saying something like that before, you know. So yeah, just drop the semi. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does the reality meet the expectation that you had going into this? Yeah, m my expectation was it was a critical way of thinking, lots of feedback, lots of questions, lots of constructive questions. Um, and so far, I've experienced that. So, you know, a lot of people get their dream. I'm halfway to the dream, but pe people get their dream. I've experienced some pro camps. And honestly, from those camps, I felt very much at home. I've already discussed this with the team and the managers that were there, that I felt very comfortable there. It felt very natural and a place that I'd been imagining for a few years. It just felt like I'd finally just dropped myself in that dream. And that's something that you mentioned to me, I think, whilst you're on the camp, we, we had a bit of a catch up and you said that kind of high performance environment, which is something that you obviously love to involve yourself in studying sports science alongside because you have that interest off the bike as well in all of the sport performance and recovery and nutrition. I think that's such an invaluable thing that taking that step up doesn't just mean that you're racing at that level, but you're surrounded by this entire unit, which is there to support high performance. And I, I like the way you mentioned the pro camp there because that's something I wanted to touch on. I suppose that was your first proper exposure to what it was like to be part of that outfit. Um, what are the key takeaways from that first pro camp? You know, the, those initial impressions, did they do anything differently without giving away too many team secrets than, than, than what you'd previously done or thought about training? The meetings were a big thing. Uh, there was a lot of time around people asking questions you know getting to know each other lots of you know you sat around the table at the same time you're riding together at the same time and you got an evening meal uh, meeting at the same time to discuss a day's events and tomorrow's uh, calendar so a lot of people around which helps and a lot of people that are very similar to you whereas on the process through the club scene I think there is such a stark difference between where people are at in individuals careers you know but on a pro team you're all paid you're all there for the same job to get the team as elevated as possible and for me that unity allowed a lot of borders to be broken down from what I've experienced before at, at uh, the club's club level I'd say I suppose you've already answered this question but I wanted to put it to you in this way I've written something down here that hopefully has a nice tie-in from last episode into this one. So last time we spoke about Hulahem Pro Comes course, a race in which you bridged across the Remco, who since recording went on to win the Vuelta and the World Championships. <laughs> just, to, just to mention that that happened between last time and this time. I know you don't want to keep rinsing it, but uh, I think no. it is something to, to at least mention. 
Uh, and you continued riding off the front with Greg Van Avermaet, Oliver Nason, just to name a few. You said in that podcast that it was a key moment where you believed it was possible to turn pro. So linking what that feeling was like then, has being part of Bingo strengthened that vision and how? Yes, it's strengthened that vision because I have direct contact with 20 other professional riders who have been at it, at least 10 of them, for six years or more. Which means, compared to club level, where you're always wondering, and that's why I said at that race, that's the first race I've had a pro experience where I can test where I'm at. I now have that at my fingertips because I, the way that they, I, I feel that they've set the team up is very much a whole unit. They very much connect the development team into the pro team. They give a lot of opportunities to say you can come in to this camp and all of that. So yeah, just that direct contact. I think that's so important, right? Like knowing the context of your performance, because it's so easy. And I know this is going to sound a little bit funny to some of the listeners, but it's relatively easy for you to rock up to an E12 crit race in the UK and win. And so it's like, oh, wow, what a fantastic rider. But then you don't know because you're racing against a much smaller pool of people. Or as soon as you become that small fish in a big pond and ride against riders that you know are good enough to be in a pro peloton, and, and, win. You, and win and you still are able to keep up in sometimes you know you're looking at the numbers you go and i'm feeling comfortable here you know those are the moments where you're able to contextualize your fitness and your performance and of course then in a race environment it becomes a little bit different but again exactly. you've already you've already had a, an, an opportunity to kind of demonstrate that as well which i wanted to, to come on but I want to hammer that home. I do believe training is a completely different beast to racing. And whatever happens in training only enhance your confidence. But until you get into the race, you can't know how you've performed. Because at the end of the day, no one talks about the performance in training when you're losing races. Well, when you're winning races. But if you're losing races, everyone talks about how you shit you're doing in training. <laughs> I guess that's the point, isn't it? It's like, yeah, if, you, if you're able to do seven watts per kilo for 20 minutes, but you've got no results to show for it, no one cares, unless maybe you're on Zwift. <laughs> but if you win a race, if you win a big race, no one's going, oh, but how many watts per kilo are you doing? Like some people might, but no one's going to remember that. They remember your name at the top of the race. And exactly. oftentimes it's not the strongest rider that wins. It's it's the rider who's got strength, but uses it in, in the correct way because, you know, there's all sorts of things with cycling about drafting and whatnot for those that, that obviously don't understand. But you were given an opportunity very early on to kind of demonstrate that contextualize that performance against other teams and kind of be a part of that pro unit even though you are on the Devo team so when was it that you were first called up to this race which I won't mention I'll let you introduce it and why so early on in the season yeah so the first race was La Tropicana Misa Bongo in Gabon and I think it came when the team was starting to plan the calendar for who was going where and that comes on the back of the camps and how they've seen you fit into the team, which riders you think they think you're clicking with and generally how you're performing at that camp and your attitude there. That's my interpretation of when and how I was selected for, for that race. So yeah, I knew for a good few weeks before that. How did you feel knowing that that was going to be your first chance to step up? I mean, very early in the season, even by your standards. Yeah, well, no, I, I've always been an advocate of racing early, and I think I'm going to do a blog post on that because at the end of the day, I'm a racer. I'm not a, I'm not a bison. I'm not a beast in training. I don't particularly like doing it. I do it till I can race. So if I get an opportunity to race, then I'll take it. Um, it just means that I can have fun a bit earlier, and especially when it's hot like that, it just adds a little bit more. Basically, a training camp. Pretty much. So how was but, it? Mega. So you know how we were talking about how being on the pro team enhances my belief of making being able to make it at that level. I very much had that feeling for myself, a uh, personal side of myself at that race. It was a confirmation of what I'd been telling myself but questioning for a good number of years. And yeah, to put the cliche on it, found myself. Uh, and I hope to hold on to that 
for as long as I can. And then on the racing side of it, yeah, it was a phenomenal experience. I loved the racing, so punchy, so aggressive, just nonstop attacks for 100Ks and just watching the pro teams with googly eyes, watching what they do, imitating what they do and taking it all on board. So take us through it. So you flew out to Gabon, which is essentially on the equator. Uh, you get set up, you get it set up in, in the hostel, the hotel, whatever it is, and you roll onto the start line. What was it like on that first stage? I, I saw pictures suddenly popping on my on my feed of you basically driving the entire peloton on the front. I was like, crumbs, this guy's riding his first race with the pro guys and he's just riding on the front. And I tried to watch it myself. And, and just to give a bit of an anecdote to the listeners now, I got scammed <laughs> by some, I don't know, Gabonese man or woman. And uh, I had 60 pounds requested from my Santander account because I tried to sign up to watch a live stream which didn't exist. In my naivety, I thought, it's a Gabonese live stream. It's not going to seem legit anyway. So I thought, well, you know, it doesn't look, maybe it's not a scam. It turns out it was. So nearly, if I didn't get my car cancelled, got scammed just to try and watch you race. But I did see the photos oh, come through <laughs> over on Twitter. And so, yeah, what, <laughs> what were you doing on the front straight away? What, how did that come about? Yeah. So first off, their Twitter feed was actually pretty mad. It created such a powerful image of the race, even though they were was very little it you could attach the images to the race to the stream afterwards and i felt they did a very good job with the coverage of the race and they stepped that up from previous years i believe but to your question and how i ended up on the front the team came on the radio at 40 k's and said control this breakaway so i did because i'm a diva rider and i've got to follow not got. Of, I wanted to follow. I came with, into the race with the goal of I'm going to do everything I can for this team. I want to experience everything. I want to listen. I want to learn. And the best way to do that is to listen and do do what they say and learn on the job, basically. So within the first 15 minutes of me riding on the front, obviously, I got a bit excited. Probably ride a bit too hard. Close the gap down a little bit too quickly. What do we mean cold. here by riding a little bit too hard for those that knows the power numbers? What are we talking about? Just riding a bit over, you know, a bit of a fat max. Yeah. What's that? Kind of into three, the... three three fifty. <laughs> you're going to have to put a paywall on that, man. <laughs> yeah. A little bit over tempo, let's say. Uh, and then Carl comes on the radio, very experienced guy for 26, and says, Tom, just, just bring it back a little bit. Bring it back to that down to tempo range. You know, one that you could pretty much do all day, but still hard. Comfortably uncomfortable, as my old coach used to say. And uh, just bring bring the gap down slowly, slowly. You've still got 100Ks to go. And bring it down to, you know, I think the target was about a minute 30 and just keep it there. Uh, From what? How, what was the gap before? Four minutes. So you brought a two and a half minute gap down. Right yeah, but not front. my own. I had I had Leonard Turgles for a very long. Well, a few, a few, you know, I did the majority of the work because he was saving his legs for the end and he did a good result at the end. But, he, you know, when I needed like a five minute break, he'd come on the front and do, you know, 10, 10 minute turn. Um, so yeah, I got a bit of help there. And then on the final circuit as well, Louis Blow as well. When the guy went for the KOM and then I was like, I was a bit hanging because I was threshold at that point. Uh, I mean, you'd yeah. literally been riding on the front the entire day of stage one of the first kind of pro level yeah, race of, ramp, the, of the season. Like our ra ramp test analogy last year, but to threshold yeah. after 100 k's straight away mate <laughs> <laughs> off tempo yeah good test though and yeah well, so if that's a starting point this year imagine where we're going to be at the end if we're going to be trying to carry on that way oh mate we're going to be on for episode three in august and it's going to be like yeah just come back from winning another uci that's the seventh of the season you're out there you're racing you're on the front one of the things that i think would be super interesting just to understand this is not going to take long but just from my own pure, personal curiosity and people that might be listening, what's it like having a race radio in? Because it's not, it's the first time that I think you've, you've ridden with one, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's the first time I rode with one. GCN actually just did a video on that, uh, on the entirety of a race fit radio and how it works. So if you're interested, go to them on the GCN tech channel because Alex Payton did that at the Tour Down Under. And I'm glad that came out or I watched that after the race because it meant I could come into the race with complete naivety and ignorance on the topic. 
and could learn just with so much joy on how this little contraption could offer so much to a race. Like, you hear so many people on Twitter and say, like, race radios take away from the race, and I'm like, no, they don't, mate. They they turn it around and make it exciting Um, because you can have tactical conversations on the fly with not only your team manager, but your five or six other so everyone's members. plugged into the the same channel. So there's only one channel for everyone. Yes, every channel's encrypted between the teams. Okay. Yeah. Um. So you have a master box in the car, which makes the car very clear to the radios, uh, on in the riders. But sometimes the right into rider communication gets a bit lost, uh, just because of connectivity issues. You're riding down at fifty k an hour. But from the car, because it's a bigger box and antenna, you get a clearer and uh, more powerful message across. No wonder you can't organise lead outs without radios very well, because you know you don't know where your riders are. Whereas if someone's telling you in the year, everyone shift to the right hand side of the road. We're you know we're near the front of the bunch on the right hand side. You just you just go there, and then you find your teammates. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. That sounds fantastic. Precisely. And I think, and sorry. I I picked up a very important lesson on guarding the wind. So you see some people have it right down on the ribs, on the lower ribs. But the, I think the trick is to get up in the shoulder, in the, in the crest of the shoulder and guard it with your face and make sure that that sound is very clear. Um, that, that's a technique that I had down and I got some good compliments for that. I really want to pick up on the point of, of, of naivety and not being too prepared going into that environment because i think as with anything in life we can we can over prepare and it almost takes the the novel experience away and you ne- never get to experience the the fear that things might go wrong or the fear of the unknown but then you figure it out along the way and then and then you're actually really grateful that you hadn't over rationalized and over planned everything and so what was the biggest overall revelation from that experience in gabon that you went in naive and are really glad that you experienced it? Was it on the bike or off the bike or, or what was it? On the bike, I think I've got a lot of things down. I've been doing it a long time. You know, there are these little nuances like the radio and the bottles and how to piss and stuff like that. I still haven't got it whilst riding, but I've sort of got it stopping at the side of the road. Um, so I guess the larger part is personally in the culture that we had and again, finding myself and coming in with this, yeah, novelty culture that I'd never experienced with my own preconceptions about, which I wrote in my blog. But, you know, you have to get so many vaccines to go there. I had had the idea of naivety before that, so I hadn't come in with a lot of thoughts. I was very apprehensive to be open and not know what to expect. And that caused the apprehension in me because I was super excited to be like, what does this country offer to me? And what I found with the music, the people, the love, the the busyness, but also laid back nature of it just created so much contrast and internal questioning and put my life into perspective being in England and how different and how down to earth it is. Literally, you're in the lungs of the earth. Uh, yeah. That was, yeah. I think it's another large, large part of being a professional athlete, isn't it? Is being able to experience different cultures. It's not just that you're going there for a bike race. You also immerse yourself off the bike. And I saw some videos of some team presentations where they started playing uh, Gabonese music or, or something of the sorts. And they're getting everyone to sway the whole body. I apologize to <laughs> everyone viewing the podcast, looking at us out of sync there. But I saw you dancing and I remember you mentioning to me just afterwards that you, you really fell into that culture. And could you describe what that felt like? Cause I think that's a, if, if, no, if nothing else, if, if, you know, bike racing aside, I think for your own personal development, which again is what the podcast really is centered on an earth based level. Uh, what was that like? Well, it's something I hold close to my heart at the moment. I'm going to be, yeah, on a personal note, that's, something that I was quite keen to experience like the race for me during that time was a on the back seat but like I knew the job that I had to do so I could focus on everything else that was around me and it opened up more doors to experience some things uh, obviously without jeopardizing any racing potential 
Um, and I've always been calculated with that. But for example, on the last night, beach club, music going for about three hours, just constant, you know, typical African beat with the drums, with the, with that upbeat vibey music. And by hour two, you know, we were just dancing, man, everyone. And there weren't even much drinks. Like in England, you hear the cliche, oh, I need to, I need to get, you know, at least tipsy to maybe dance there. Nah, it's so open and so welcoming. that It's like, yeah, come on, come on into the line dance. And uh, yeah, by the end of it, you had a bunch of total riders, myself, a few of the staff members as well, just going at it and having a class time. Like, that's one of the biggest smiles I've had on my face for a very long time, if ever. Wow. Honestly, I was like, <laughs> I've got a vision in my right mind right now of you all in your in your full kit wearing cleats doing the conga. I'm assuming you've changed out your kit by this point. Yeah, no, because yeah, we went for a dip as well, so I'd literally just got oh, changed. Wow. So uh, yeah, like I said to a lot of my friends over the years, like, oh, British clubbing is not for me. The music's not quite right. I don't feel like I can dance here, you know. But I know I can dance because I do it on my own. And I have very good tempo. I have good beats. Uh, you know, I've done some dance lessons in the past where I've been on point, a good technique and all that. Um, athlete brain coming out there. But then you go there and it's very life affirming that you go there and you just go and dance without even doing anything. You're like, yeah, I knew it. But because of British culture and British, at least Southern, you know, being imposed onto me, uh yeah i mean it is quite clean the abundant quite strange exactly and yeah lots of eyes on you well even though there aren't eyes but no one wants to pay attention but they equally have a thought about everything it's very strange uh yeah you can't really describe it but you go there and it's just like the thing that i've been saying and people have been kind of taking a knock at for a few years to be like yeah i knew it is uh is good almost like it it's like going back to gull again last year go and listen to that podcast yeah mate well i think we mentioned it in that it's one. exactly the same as yeah as what you're saying on the bike as well you know you're you're suddenly put into the environment where you're going yeah this is this is what i thought it was going to be like this is i feel i feel comfortable here i feel ready i feel like everything's exactly. come at the right time uh being in that outlet that step up is exactly the same as what you're describing here about being in that environment and feeling comfortable and, and hopefully and i do hope that this continues for you not only in in gabon of course that race is now over and, and you're back home about to fly out again for another training camp but i hope that continues for for future and that that kind of bond as well grows with your teammates and hopefully that that, that culture is really good for your your personal growth uh, off the bike because that only helps everything else right and we spoke about that last time exactly yeah for sure you got to have a life outside to be going on a bike if you don't have that yeah you find it quick uh but yeah as you say it's uh it's quite a unique experience and i'm very ha grateful and glad to be where i am taking the opportunities and very proud of how i've got to where i am and how i'm taking them on board yeah i'm quite confident that it's going to continue because i've that's why i've wanted to write the blog and make it, you know, rinse it within the week of it finishing and then put it aside, let the thought sit and settle and not really touch that. So yeah, for a week afterwards, you know, it was a light training week because it's been a massive two months just to settle down, process the thoughts, be excited about the thoughts and where you've got to and hold on to them and chronologically filter them so that that's how I believe the memories are made. What do you what That's do you mean by like chronologically filter? As in, like build your own story in your head of how things have happened. Yeah, that's what I do with right. racing. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when I described the Bjorg Lambrecht, I did that for about a week afterwards. I created the story of how it happened, which is as close to the truth as it possibly can be. Super powerful, though. I think you know, hu humans, we 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 think and we convey emotions and we we articulate things through the lens of stories i think your ability to do that and place yourself as an actor within your story 
and developing to the best of your ability and, and pursuing that career as a professional cyclist is a hundred percent a story that if you tell yourself it will happen it will i don't want to use this word but it does manifest like if you if you wake up in the morning you tell yourself you're an athlete your behavior subconsciously will align with that I've, i mean i've experienced this in the last probably month myself as well you know getting into really good habits because i always think oh i'm an athlete it's not that i'm just trying to do this i am an athlete you know what i mean like it's, it's all that kind of shift of identity as well yeah, exactly um which is a little bit of a tangent but there's one more thing i want to touch on just on the Amisa Bongo point, which is the success that your team had. Uh, I couldn't, yeah. you know, continue this podcast without mentioning won a couple of stages at the back end. How did that play out? So on the Saturday, it was a criterium circuit, one I was looking forward to, but I turned up after about a 40 minute sauna plane flight, to put it in lightly, uh, everyone was sweating. You got out of it and 30 degrees was fresh. So my legs were blocked. I was very disappointed because it was a very, it was a style course, and I was like, "Damn, that's 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 a good day." The first the f- the first breakaway went, and then we had two guys in, and that was it. I can't really say much else on that stage. Like they did that themselves, Alexi and Carl. We just sat back and made sure nothing would close. So um, yes, a team effort, but very much on the backs of Carl and Alexi. Uh, and then Sunday again, very very much a team effort. Everyone had a part to play in that one. And Leonard got his mountain jersey in the breakaway, made, meant we could sit back and relax. And then coming into the final, we played it super well. We took the left hand side of the peloton slightly behind total energy. And Alexi did a phenomenal good couple of K lead out from five to three, uh, then blew his doors. And then Carl finished off the placing, I think, into the final few hundred meters, just had a, you know, was around Alex just to offer that support, whether it was in front, behind, I wasn't there. I just heard fractions of the conversation that they had. But, uh, and then personally for myself, I did a massive lead out from about, you know, 1.7K till about 600 meters to go. So just over a kilometer and a bit in the front of the peloton, driving it in the gutter and on the left-hand side out, uh, making sure that anyone that wanted to try and come around me was going into the wind. and that placed us well into the front. Alex was about into the eighth or tenth position, coming into a tailwind sprint. So yeah, it couldn't open. And then he opened the doors up and finished it off himself. So yeah, very good team effort. Good way to one. close off the week. Everyone bringing yes, together. Yes, with a we had a couple more podiums as well. Alex for him it was coming. He had a third and a second, and then Louis had a very very good start to open up the season behind Jeffrey Shoup, who was on some mad form. Is that the guy with a really cool beard? Yeah, he got second. Yeah, <laughs> the the beard wins as cinema win cinema wins would describe on YouTube. Uh, I think you're going for that sort of look, aren't you? Oh, um, if I could grow a beard that good, yeah, I'd be on oh, men's mate. health. It's taken him years, I assure <laughs> you. I think because uh, I've seen images of him younger. It's not quite there, but yeah, he's cultivated it <laughs> over crossed. time. You got time, yeah. mate. Um, but yeah super lean super on form and louis got second there and opened the week up with a positive atmosphere and the atmosphere through the whole week was that naivety we were just looking forward to experiencing what we experienced on any given day and what we were told by by the organization which again was very smooth fantastic i mean the whole experience is i've got a smile on my face for those who are watching i think that's an awesome window into what it's like a bit of a roller coaster i'd imagine from start to finish with that whole trip out there and something which you can as you've described take away absorb into the memory tell yourself that story and then tick it off and move forward into the rest of the season one of the things i wanted to cover on this podcast was how you're balancing with uni it's something that we spoke about a little bit on the first podcast it's something that you know some people choose to do the uni pass some people choose to work part time in bike shops whilst they're trying to develop themselves and get into the professional scene so what does that look like currently with you going out to training camps and early season racing yeah i don't know how much i'll divulge in this because it's very much something i'm trying to settle it's in like myself a work at in this progress. point it's a work in progress thing and whilst it's a work in progress thing i don't like to share too much because it is a internal process within my inner circles and seeking that advice fresh advice and until that's done i don't feel comfortable to share that stuff um that's just on a personal level with anything you see from me it's slightly time delayed 
Uh, that's just my honesty because I like figuring it out myself and then being comfortable settled as like, I'm in a good place. Yeah, we're in a good place. We're going to share that information or that story or whatever way you want to look at it. Um, the only thing I will say is it's obviously I'm going to still, I'm going to finish this term and see what happens. Um, yeah, and just get the work done, do as well as I can, get a higher grade as I can do uh, on the on the back of turning up to what I can do and, uh, yeah, giving it as good as I got because, as we discussed at the beginning, it offers a lot to the sport and a lot to my interpretation of the sport. So I want to keep it for as long as I can possibly do. And I'm trying to work, just uh, keep an open dialogue with the university to say why I want it to work and hopefully it's a two-way process. I'm also not naive in the fact that I'm one guy in a university. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm arguably fighting a closed, closed battle, but uh, yeah, one that I'm going to give it a good shot because I want to open the doors up for future athletes at University of Surrey because it's an ideally placed university, in my opinion, for athletes that want to compete abroad. Yeah, I think it's frustrating for, for students who do know and, and for those that don't <clears throat> there is this kind of late summer assessment and the, the rigidness in which exams are placed and sometimes those things fall on awkward days for like you know if you're flying out to a training camp when there's an exam you can't do an exam on a plane so it's these things which i think are obviously quite conversations that you're trying to raise as someone who's trying to do both and i think just to pick up on on the fact that you mentioned that your sports science was helping with the understanding on the bike, almost vice versa as well. Being in that team environment and may maybe learning from the physiotherapists or whoever else on the team on the scientific lens acts as a little bit of revision to then go back and, and not completely fail the exams, right? Like it, it's kind of, there's a little exactly. bit of interplay, um, which I think is, exactly. is super interesting. And, and obviously, you know, it's always that plan B, but it's not only a plan B, but it also helps the plan A. I think that's the important thing that people think that, oh, it's, it's a backup option just in case things don't go well and you don't believe it will happen. But actually, no, it, it also does help the vision. Yeah. So I think that's, um yeah, something that which is obviously playing exactly. out in your own life. And again, for future episodes and when I catch up with you, we'll, we'll see how the situation develops. Yeah. So like I said, inner circles, mate. Absolutely. <laughs> Most people need to lean more towards authenticity, but there is a point, there's a threshold where authenticity just opens you up to too much because you say things that you regret, you say things with information that then surfaces two weeks later, that means you've changed your mind and context always changes. So yeah, there's there's a level of keeping your class to your chest. There's also a level of when to be authentic. And I think you're you're striking that balance right now. And yeah, that sounds about right to me. That's an aspiration that I've got. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm trying to, share an honest story when I figured it out. When I figured out the answer to the story that I want to share, that's when it happens. But on that process to find whatever answer I can is as you know, closed off and private as possible. Yeah. Speaking about other things off the bike, you mentioned on the Quick Link podcast that I listened to a couple of weeks ago that some professionals, they get into the sport, they stop watching the sport because it becomes their job. And you've been sat at home watching some of the racing. I wanted to get your thoughts on on the recent cyclocross world championships. Uh, I just about caught the back of it. Yeah. Uh, thoughts? Yeah. Matthew Vanderpol, Wout van Aert. Mega, mega happy Vanderpol one. Yeah. Personally, I think he's a class rider. He rides on emotion, and he's very uh, inspirational for me personally. How come? I see a lot of his style in myself see a lot of the energy energy systems that i use and can co um connect with the way that he rides a bike and imagine how he rides a bike how i would do that in a race um and i try and learn from watching him do that his technique how he puts the power out on the on the bike and all that uh and i look at how how he rides biomechanically and all of that stuff so for me it's a lot more than just him winning it's a lot of connection that i feel there yeah. I suppose not to say that I'm anything like Vanderpool. <laughs> like my God, that man's an incredible specimen of an athlete. So yeah, I just imagine that you know, as anyone does, aspires to be inspired by someone like. I that. mean, 
you, you do put yourself into categories quite naturally, don't you? You kind of look at people and go, okay, out of the cyclists, I most resemble this kind of rider, this kind of punchy rider who isn't a Roman Bardet praying mantis 60 kilo, but can just do big watts, do repeated big efforts, which someone like a Wout van Aert and a Matthew van der Poel can do. And that shift in professional cycling, we touched on it in the first episode, but I think is super promising. And I think this kind of move away from being way too lean and way too kind of focusing on weight and not focusing on just being a stronger, more capable athlete is super promising, especially for a rider like yourself. And I, I know we spoke in the first podcast about the fact that it was always kind of a, a challenging topic to approach when when teams were talking and when people have certain preconceptions about what they think a cyclist should look like. But you've been able to demonstrate in recent months, you know, you are getting to a high performance place. You're developing yourself both in, in the power and in the weight, but also you are always going to be uh, a, w- a Wout van Aert, Matthew van der Poel style rider. So I think there's there's a lot of hope there. Also proves you don't really need watts per kilo for a lot of type of racing. Why do you think people put so much focus on it, especially in the UK? Because I, I see all these people, they're just looking at, oh, what's your watts per kilo? What's your watts per kilo? It's like in the UK, uh, we spoke about it on the podcast with Tom Ramsey I did last week about you know, the the biggest climbs in the UK are probably like five, six minutes on a road race course. So yeah, well, have you got any particular thoughts on that? I do have my beliefs on, as any rider does, as any, you know, aspiring uh, sports scientist does, they build their own beliefs and values on what should be focused on with context. Um, For me, it is context. Everything's with context. You look at the course, you look at how that course is ridden you look at the weather conditions and that adds a lot more to the the way that it's ridden and what is the main focus of that race and what is has the greatest Im- impact on that race result at the end of the day it's a race result that matters so that's what i look at sure to the point quite quite connected to the initial discussion as well talking about race results mattering more than an abstract what's peculiar number so yeah, I think you let you got you got to let yeah, results. I, I, I'm all for it. If you do set if you do seven watts per kilo in a race and win the damn thing by five minutes, fair play to you. Rem, Remco, I'll take that. <laughs> but yeah, um, but you know, if you're chatting about it before, go and show me in a race. What do you think the the future of UK racing is? Uh, you 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 spend most of your time out racing out in Belgium, and there seems to be this this British cycling thing is collapsing. I mean, without people like Jake, I don't know where <laughs> where we'd be. What what are your thoughts on the direction that things are going in? I don't know, mate. I don't know. Is there anything we can do to kind of revive the the scene, or is it just a culture thing? It's a culture thing. I think we're so against riding a bike, like even ten minutes to like even walking, man. Like the traffic here where i live in adelston is just obscene and you're walking maximum 30 minutes to a place like just mental man like why why drive it land rover to the place that you want to go but that's what everyone does it's like oh why are you riding a bike because i'm going to get there quicker than you it's like yeah even though you know i might not be the fittest guy but i was talking about it today on the the bun run an average person riding a 10k distance probably the average to work right 10 to 16 k's right maximum 50 minutes if you're really you know not going anywhere (laughs) like come on yeah and e-bikes now make it so much more feasible to do that it's like what are you paying for an electric car you just might as well just get an e-bike with a rack on the back and I think that cult, fundamental culture that we don't want to walk or bike or be active in a way that means that we can free up the world in, in terms of busyness and congestion um, fundamentally hinders where we can do races. Because there's a lot of courses around Ripley as well that you could do, but no one's going to do them there because the roads are terrible and no one wants to do it. Just on one thing, are you tapping the desk because I can start to hear the mic? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting riled. Right. 
this is why you don't ask me yeah it is frustrating especially from my perspective because you know i'm someone that's on the fringes i would do racing if it was cheaper you know given Mm -hmm. if i lived in the same scenario as i did but i was in belgium and it was whatever it is eight pound for 10 10 euros euros, and then if i finish then i get half of it back five yeah then i'd be Mm -hmm. racing every week and you finish if you finish in the top 20 you get all of it back and then anything past what you 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 get like prize money 12th yeah you get a large majority of that profit to go and spend on your frites afterwards yeah it's it's frustrating and i think i mean i I discussed this with owen lake on one of my podcasts as well uh i actually used you you as an example as a uni student who wants to race but is 30 pound entry and you're losing that 30 pound basically guaranteed if you're entering an e12 as a uni student like not to say, you know, you, you might get some money back, but even to get in the top three, you're going to equal that cash. You know, you have to get a podium minimum in a quality race to get that back. Yeah, I uh, I did one race. My last my last bike race was summer of 2021. I did a three, four road race and I got second. So I made a net profit for the 2021 season. But if I'd done any more racing, it's just it's just money down the bin and it's not it's not super expensive you know it's not it's not rowing but it's it accumulates and for someone as a it's 35 pound as race, a young man. rider right. if you're trying to get into it trying to get fit and healthy and pursue the sport you know there's there's those barriers to entry which which again it's such a systemic thing as you've discussed it's not it's not just a case of oh british cycling and mismanaging the money it's literally at the root level of race planning and the culture of the like the local councils and things and the road planning and all this stuff which i don't know I, I, we're just we're just we're not providing any solutions here we're just complaining <laughs> so. no. well i've got i've got an episode with seb otley coming out which hopefully poses some questions to ask again to find those solutions so it's very much an open discussion on those fixing those problems and yeah the one with owen lake as well just asking the questions so you want to go and check that out athlete experience the athlete experience on any podcast the man has departed from the chopper house it is now the athlete experience um yes because it it feels more in in line with what i want to do i can use more use it more readily i think it's not not one of those things it's a time and a place and and it kind of grows on from that so yeah uk scene we haven't got any solutions but maybe seb otley who runs what was it fat creations is that is that goodwood yeah he's got a race in april uh yeah goodwood location yeah on the old Olympic circuit, he's got his second edition of that race coming in April. Oh, well, if you're listening, get your get your race entries in. Speaking of the the future of that, bringing it back onto your own personal journey and kind of gradually bringing this podcast to the close, it's been really insightful to hear how the end process of 2022 went, getting that contract, and how the transition has been over to bingo and kind of mixing up with with the pros even though you are on on the devo team what does the rest of the season have in store for you now that you've had this experience under your belt of going out and racing very early on i know you've mentioned that you're going out to a training camp so yeah what's next on the on the calendar yeah so we've got the training camp next week and then the first opening weekend in belgium for not only the pros but everyone like uh the 26th 25th and 26th of February is opening weekend with Omloop Het Newsbad in the pl- pros, which we are racing with the pro team, I believe. I have to double check that actually. And for us, it's against Darden or Brussels Opwick with the first under 23 road series with Netherlands. And then, yeah, you've got an abundance of youth and junior races on that weekend as well to open up the classic season and uh, the race season um that's why it's called opening weekend and belgium very much gets on board with that um after that point uh i'm still waiting on the calendar and uh that's what the next training camp's about like i discussed before it depends how you treat that training camp how you turn up to it and how how you deal with the challenges that are posed in front of you you mentioned that you're a little bit as the apprentice in the pro team but then not not official leader but kind of like guiding the the devo i'm one of the oh. oldest and i'm one of the oldest and most experienced in the devo team you know a lot of them are first second or you know we've got a few third years in there as well but i believe i've got a lot of experience i've got a lot of experience to share and 
I, I can take confidence in how I acted with the pro team that I can be confident in sharing that with the under 23 team and bringing them up as quickly as they can. Cause first years, however much they did well in junior is a, it's almost a blank slate to uh, know how to race at that, at that, at that level. Yeah. Do you like that? Do you like, do you like being the, the guide as well as the apprentice? I'll find out. I don't know if I even am going to be that next week. It's just my anticipation of what might happen. It's a target that I have. If someone else comes along and is more experienced than me, fair play. I'll I'll take that on board. There might be a first year who's as good as Remco on the team. You don't know. Because um, I've not even really trained with them or raced with them yet. So there's a lot of new guys and a lot of good guys coming through now. So um, I look forward to learning from them as much as I hope to share the experiences that I've, I've learned over those years. And of course, assert dominance, ride them off the wheel and show them who's boss, right? Next week. Got to do a new 20 minute power. Yeah. To... It's, it's a training week, mate. <laughs> it's a training week. No, 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 no dick swinging with yep. me. Mate. Not, not a chance. If you're dick swinging, you're getting a right toll off on a, on this level of camp. It's a tr- no, just any anywhere. If you dick swing with me, you're getting a told off, man. Like, wh- why is there ego involved? Just chill out with talking. You're not half wheeling me. That's 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 my non-negotiable on a bike. I think. Just be civilized. When when we get race numbers on, go for it. But in trading, just do what you need to do. Don't don't care about what I do. I think a lot of people could be uh, taking notes to that. Um, yeah, no, really, really good conversation, Tom. I'm, I'm pleased that you decided to come on for episode two, and I wish you all the best with the upcoming race season. I, I look forward to being in that inner circle and actually finding out more of the details, which the listeners will hear six months after they happen <laughs> uh, on the next episode. But um, yeah, yeah, all the best, man, and and thanks for the time. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. Thank you. I I enjoyed that.